it is my pleasure to introduce you to Kirill from Lockhart, is it? Lockhart, uh, that's right. Lockhart, and uh, who is teaching a class on three recipes from Roberto de Noala's Liberio de Usados. I apologize for my Russian horrible pronunciation, but please go ahead. Thank you, everybody. It's I'm delighted to be here with you this evening for my time. Good morning to those who are um, uh, uh, on the other side of the world. I know it's very, very late, late at night or early in the morning for our colleague, um, my um, friends on the US side of things um, and hopefully good timing so that any friends of mine in Europe can join us as well. Today, I'm going to be finishing off uh, a recipe which I, I actually kind of started this morning in, in a, um, to try and uh, fit this into a one hour class. The, the, the recipe is a lamb stew and the other recipe is a 16th century Spanish donut. How good is that? Now, um, about the Libro de Guisados, which is the Catalan name for it, it, it became translated into Spanish and I'm actually running off the Spanish edition from 1525, um, uh, which was titled Libro de Cocina. And um, I want to thank uh, Robin Carol Mann for her um, uh, translation of the into English, which is what I've been using since my uh, 16th century Spanish is non-existent. So uh, I will. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to cook uh, the, um, the this recipe, which is called oranges of Zativa, and they are essentially and, and and it goes on to say oranges of Zativa, which are cheesecakes. Interesting. I'm going to read the recipe out. I will have, I've already kind of done a, the cooking show magic thing of, ha of halfway making this, but I will st actually still do and work with you um, through the recipe to show you how I, I've done it. And I'll talk with you a bit about the decisions I've made in how I came to the recipe that I did. So I'll start though by reading out the translated recipe. And it says, you must take new cheese and um, fresh and curd cheese and grind them in a mortar together with eggs. Then take dough and knead those cheeses with the curd cheese together with the dough. And when everything is incorporated and kneaded, take a very clean casserole um, and cast into it a good quality quantity of sweet pork fat or fine sweet oil. And when the pork grease or oil boils, make some balls from said dough like toy balls or round oranges and cast them into the casserole in such a manner that the ball goes floating in the casserole. And you can also make buñuelos, which is fritters of the dough, um, or whatever shapes and ostentations you wish. And when they are the color of gold, take them out and cast in as many others. And when everything is fried, put it on plates and cast honey on it. And on top of the honey, cast ground sugar and cinnamon. However, note one thing, that you must put a bit of leaven in the cheeses and in the eggs and in the other put flour. And when you make the balls, grease your hands with a little fine oil and then the balls go into the casserole. And when it is inside, if the dough cracks, it is a signal that it is very soft and you must cast in more flour into the dough until it is harder. And when the fritter is made and fried, cast your honey on it and cast sugar and cinnamon on top, as is said above. So you kind of, it's, you get halfway through the recipe and then it tells you that actually there's yeast going in this dough. Um, so what I'm gonna do is we're gonna start with getting my um, uh, wet ingredients and grinding them up. This is gonna be a little bit noisy in the mortar and pestle here, but I really do wanna show you how um, it's done. If you wanted to do this, you could actually probably put it in a blender and blend them instead. Um, I do encourage people to try using the mortar and pestle because you do get more flavors out of things you do in the mortar and pestle. Um, and it's just as noisy, really. <laughs> but anyway, so what I've used in the way of cheese, and I've experimented with a few different cheeses for this, because of course the first question is what is um, what is new cheese and and what is fresh cheese or curd cheese. Um, what I did was I did a bit of research on cheeses and and the making of cheeses and fresh cheese. There are there are a few different options of of what it could be and, or what it could be like. And so ricotta quark, um, uh, uh, what's it called? The Italian one, mascarpone, um, uh, are all some examples of a fresh cheese. I also um, gave, I, so I've tried with all of those different things just to, to, to experiment with them. And what I've settled for this recipe um, for is 
ricotta, um, but I have made it just as happily with quark, which is quite similar to ricotta, but has a little more, more if you can imagine, kind of a texture of a fine ricotta, um, but a little bit more liquid and with a little sourer taste. But I didn't find the final product made any real difference to the recipe. So um, for me, ricotta is a bit easier to get. In the way of new cheese, well, what defines a new cheese? Um, a bit of research on that seems to conclude that it's a cheese that is less, you know, that is um, not uh, matured for, is matured for, for less than a month, essentially. Um, and there are a few options for what that could be. I, I wasn't able to find anything in the way of those styles of cheeses um, here in Australia, which were uh, Spanish, but what I've, chosen to use instead is a mozzarella, which is again, a, quite a new cheese. It's not a mature cheese. It's kind of stretchy. Um, and so it grinds up well and, and works well for this recipe. So the recipe that I've got, I will share with you. I have written the notes and they're in my teacher's folder. And so will become available to you. Uh, and what I did for, for the recipe is 150, and you can note these down if you have a pen and paper if you'd like. Um, is 150 grams of uh, mozzarella and 150 grams of ricotta, so equal parts. And um, what I've, I've got here is actually a half size of that because I've already made up a dough and I really don't need that many donuts in my life. <laughs> so I'm going to pop them into my mortar and pestle. And these are then ground to, together, as the recipe says. Now, the other thing I did experiment with, apart from trying about six different cheeses, I did try with a chevre because it doesn't actually say that it's um, necessarily cow's milk cheese. It could have been a goat's milk cheese or a sheep's milk cheese. And I try um, a version using a goat's milk um, just to give it a try and see what it tasted like. The, again, the decisions I made on, on the final recipe were based really on how the final recipe came out and what they taste like and what the texture is like. And this mixture and, and um, pattern plausibly correct or, cl or close to um, plausibly correct and um, make a really lovely texture. So I also, so it's, it's pretty sticky. So here, come on. Sorry. Turn that down so you can see more, more into the water and pestle there. You don't really need to see my face. Wash my hair. And once I've got this on to, um, to start kind of, sure, um, I guess, growing, the, the yeast growing, I will then move to my forming the balls from the dough I've already made. So it doesn't have to be ground really, really finely. I think it's good if it can be, but it's gonna be a nice, even kind of mix. And again, as I said, if you do this in a food processor or something like that, it's gonna be quite quick. Actually, that is not looking too bad already. Kind of lumpy-ish, but... And I, I did grate the mozzarella first, so that makes it a little bit faster to grind. Right. And then I put my giant in my egg. Ah, here's an egg that I prepared earlier. This one is from my from my Black Betty, my chook from my backyard. So you throw it in there and add that to your grind. Now from, from following the instruction, it says you should add the yeast, and it says you add this to the, not to the flour as we would a modern, um, or, or the dough um, as we might modern bread or something like that. It says you actually add it to the cheeses. So that's what I did. Now I did try this recipe. Um, I'm, I'm using an instant yeast for this recipe. Uh, for, sort of for simplicity's sake, I did do a version of it, however, um, using a sourdough yeast um, so that I could see what happened with a kind of natural yeast process and how different it was. Um, the, the one big difference is that with a sourdough yeast, you do have to, it just takes a lot longer. It takes a whole day for the, for the dough really to get prepared and, and do any rising. And, and, and although it doesn't it actually anywhere in the instructions talk about rising the dough at all, 
I've chosen to do so because it, um, what's the point of adding the yeast if you're not going to let it um, do some rising. So you can see now, though looking into my pot or raising my mortar up, you can see there a kind of slightly lumpy but moderately homogeneous dough. Uh, sorry, um, liquid. What? I'm doing that to, add, to that is to adding yeast. And I found that a teaspoon of, of instant yeast um, to one lot of the thing made a, a nice amount of dough. And that's for two cups of flour. Now, I've set those things together. So I'm just going to set that for a moment aside so that it can sort of sit and the yeast can start kind of working on um, becoming active from the goodness that's in the cheese. Let that rest for a moment. And I will um, switch to showing you the actual dough that I made, made earlier so you can see it. And that's partly also because I need to get this formed into the donut shape um, so that it can then have its rest and do a little rising before I throw it into the into the um, oil. So here's my dough. It's quite a sticky, soft dough, you can see, but it's actually not bad. Um, you could form it into balls and fry it as balls, as the recipe said. However, um, because of the size of the, 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 don the donuts and the fact that the instructions say that you can form them into any shape you like, what I actually do have done and I like um, doing is to form it into a ring. So just making it into a ball and then just giving a little hole with my thumb in the middle to make a little ring. And lay those down. The, the reason for doing that rather than having the ball is that um, donuts, you have to cook them at a moderately high temperature. So it's probably around 180 degrees, um, 190 degrees Celsius. And uh, so that they're nice and crisp on the outside. And uh, if you boil them too long, of course, they'll burn. And you, But you need to boil them for long enough that the dough in the middle um, uh, is cooked. So getting rid of the dough in the middle speeds that process up, as well as giving you the plus of more surface area to be fried, which is never, never a bad thing, let's face it, in this world. <laughs> Deep fried food. So I'm going to form these donuts so that I can let them rest while I deal with other things. And I don't know whether this is how you traditionally form donuts or not, because I've never made traditional uh, form donuts. Now, the, the, uh, the other decision and, and choice I made was that although the recipe says to add, uh, to make a dough, to, to make the uh, eggs and cheese um, and yeast mixture and then mix it in with a dough, um, I try, I did do that, but I found that it's actually really difficult to mix one, a, a damp dough with uh, a liquid. It's uh, very hard work to, to mix it. Um, and so I uh, did do a version like that. I, as I said, I've done many of these versions now. Um, but in the end, what I chose to do was to uh, add the, the cheese uh, mixture directly to flour and said to make a dough. So that is a bit of interpretation on my part. The outcomes really weren't very much different from the dough and the dough that I, I tried with a couple of different doughs. One was a making a kind of dough, um, uh, donuts are often made with uh, butter in the dough. And so I tried making a butter uh, and, you know, rubbing flour into to, um, and butter together to, form breadcrumbs and then adding a little bit of water to make a dough and then using that mixing that with the mixture um, and then frying that uh, and found that that made a very oddly crumbly textured donuts uh, it's um, one of the, my family members liked them the most of all but they are certainly the in texture the furthest away from a, a modern donut recipe it doesn't say what the dough should be. So the other version I tried was just a simple flour and water dough um, and I made it into a kind of soft, uh, softish dough and then mixed that in with my 
equids. And those fried quite well and had quite a good texture, um, but they were, it was hard to combine the two. It, um, it was quite a difficult thing to do, especially manually. Getting my donut sizes are a bit, a bit um, variable in size. And what I'd like to know is how big oranges of Zativa might have been in the 16th century. So that would answer how big these are actually supposed to be according to the recipe. But since it says you can make them in any form you like, this is the form we've got. So one last dough. Oh, there we go. And now we have a tray of donuts sort of sitting and I'll let those rest for a bit and to, to, um, to kind of warm and uh, maybe expand a little. In my processes of, of doing this recipe, I did discover a really handy hint if you are making your, um, yes, I, um, Marinda, Marinda's asked if I made any in balls rather than donut shapes. I did, and I found problems with getting them to, to, to be cooked all the way through. So that's why I moved to the kind of more, more donut shape. Um, but I, but I, I did make them in donut balls. I think if you, if I turned the temperature of the oil down just a little bit, then it, it would um, potentially, you could have it in the oil for longer and get the dough cooked all the way through. So back to our oh, mortar and pestle now. And I'm actually going to do this, do this actually in the mortar and pestle. Uh, and I'm just adding into it one because I'm doing a half sized one, one cup of flour. What I um, recommend though is having a bowl and just um, and having the flour in there and then adding um, the kind of wet ingredients uh, to the flour rather than, than this, this case where I'm adding the flour to the wet ingredients. I'm going to do it this way so that way I don't dirty as many dishes. <laughs> Using a spoon first just to scrape inside of my mortar. And again, you can probably see, I hope, that the dough is starting to come together again, just come together a little bit. And um, if you handle it with your hands, it's very soft and very sticky at this stage. So that's why the spoon is good for at least the early part of this, just to kind of bring in the dry and the, soft, um, the wet ingredients. But then you have to get hands in. So you get in with the hands. And once you start kind of moving it together, it will form quite a soft and sticky dough. Uh, probably a fair amount softer if you've ever made bread, a fair amount softer than bread dough. I found that kind of moisture dough to be good. I guess um, because you're not, because it hasn't got any sugar in, in it, um, separate sugar in it, and because it hasn't, um, it's a kind of not a, a kind of modern recipe. It's, I, I think, found that the softer dough is good because the, it allows the yeast to sort of uh, process and, and digest more easily and um, build air. If it's a stiff dough, then it actually, you know, you need to have, I guess, strong yeast. Um, just like sourdough, um, sourdough's um, doughs are much softer than a normal dough. But you can see there, we have a dough. Now, um, and you don't actually need this for, to need to, this for a long time. I do need it a bit because, of course, you want to kind of activate gluten with the with the yeast but having a good long rise especially if you if you do do the sourdough, a sourdough version of this um, you will get that without having to do a lot of kneading and so voila we have our dough how easy is that so that dough I will set aside just to to kind of rise a bit it won't rise hugely like a, a loaf of bread but it will rise a bit and become quite a soft dough like as you saw that I was handling before. The handy hint I learned from my sister actually is that if you are 
um, having trouble finding a good temperature in your house because dough rises best at about 24 to 26 degrees and not much hotter. And so your oven will probably um, is unlikely to go low enough to, to make that temperature. And if you're like I am in the middle of winter somewhere, uh, my house is never heated above 20 degrees during winter time. But what you can do is you can put it in a bowl and put it um, in your microwave. Don't microwave it, but um, leave the door of the microwave open, just a crack, just enough to make the light go on. And then you close that up and the heat that comes from the light will actually heat up the, the space of the microwave to about 24, 25 degrees. And it will sit there quite happily proving your dough for you. Handy heat. So there's our dough, oh, rising. Now, while um, the donuts that I formed before are doing their thing, what I'm going to do is work on my lamb stew. I talked to you about my lamb stew. So the reason why I decided to do two recipes at once was because of the fact that don't, don't, don't need to rest and all of that sort of stuff. And I actually did this whole lamb recipe, in fact, in the morning class, uh, using cheating, using a pressure cooker. And uh, so you can do that. But I also, at the same time, after that class, put on some lamb to cook. So the lamb recipe is very, very simple. It says, take a piece of mutton and make little pieces of it and cast it to cook in an earthen pot with the broth of the pot. And after cooking it well, take saffron and cloves and pepper and blend it with a taste of vinegar and cook it a little with that. And then take egg yolks without the whites and beat them very well and cast them within and stir it in one direction until it is thick and cast in your taste of honey and then remove it. So I have um, had on the stove, had in the cooker, some lamb and I actually did this by the cheapest way to get the lamb at the time was to buy a leg roast and then cut that into pieces. I boiled the, the bones to make stock and then um, I have cooked this in the, just the, in the lamb stock so it doesn't have anything in it in the way of herbs or spices or anything like that apart from a little bit of salt. It's basically just lamb. So my lamb's all done and ready to make the sauce. I've got, I've, I've uh, I, for this I actually have um, removed the, uh, the, the uh, lamb, uh, uh, liquid from the lamb, and I'm going to make the sauce separately, just simply because stirring the, the lamb around and around and around is not going to be helpful for the lamb, which is now extremely well cooked. <laughs> So I've got about maybe a cup and a half of liquid out of the lamb. It's actually looking a little on the fatty side. I've already um, drained off uh, some, some fat. Uh, one of the things I found with the with recipes from this period is a lot of um, the, the Danola recipes talk about fatty lamb stock. They really like fatty mutton stock or fatty lamb stock. And I have used lamb here, not mutton, because it's really hard to get hold of mutton. I don't know whether it's the same wherever you are, but it's really hard to get your hands on, on mature um, sheep meat. Um, for those who aren't familiar with the term mutton, um, sheep kind of come in lamb, which is a little tiny sheep, and then um, hoggart, which is kind of in between, and then mutton, and mutton is a mature sheep and it's got a much stronger lamby, kind of sheepy taste to it than, um, than lamb does. And it's a... Um, it's uh, often not sold because it's got such a strong taste. People find the taste just a little bit over the top. So they, they, it's, that's why it's hard to find. Where's my hot bowl? Sorry, I need a bowl for the yolks to go in. So I'm gonna separate my egg yolks. Should do that all chefy with one hand, but um, uh, there we go. Yeah, so 
we've separated our egg yolks out. Um, and spice-wise, it's the recipe says that it you take uh, pepper and cloves and um, saffron. So uh, as with uh, I did with this morning's class, or maybe I should do it with a different flavour. No, I'll do it the same. The the pepper I've chosen to use is cubebs, so um, or tail pepper. I think that it could probably do with more pepper than I tried last time. Uh, so I'm going to add a few more. Um, peppercorns. I'm going to try and hold this up to the camera and see if you can um, spot the tail. It's called tail pepper also because it has comes with a little stem still attached to it, unlike um, brown pepper or black pepper. It's not quite as um, spicy as brown as black pepper, but has a really lovely taste. So I'm going to throw a few of those in there. Two, three, four. We have a comment in the chat while you're doing that. When I was making it this afternoon, I thought that it would be easier to make the sauce without the lamb in it. I'm glad it wasn't just me finding it challenging. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and I and although I, I mean cloves have quite a strong taste, so um, this morning I actually only tried one clove, but I'm actually going to spice it up now and put two cloves into it into the spice grind. And what how I'm doing that is I've got here. A uh, little mortar and pestle, and so I'm going to grind these up in the mortar and pestle. And I've got some lovely saffron, so I'll uh, throw that in as well. And because I'm feeling wealthy, I'm going to add quite a lot of that. You deserve it, all of you. And go and tilt you down so you can see. These grind quite easily. A little mortar and pestle. So you can kind of see I press them first. Just you do want to grind them moderately finely because nobody loves to get a big chunk of pepper or a big chunk of clove in their food, do they really? Um, it could become a, a tad on the gritty side. Now it says to to um, to uh, blend um, grind these and blend them with a, a taste of vinegar. So vinegar wise, I would be using a red wine vinegar as their preferred vinegar um, for this. Although I'm not going to right now because I don't have any in the house. Um, and the reason for the red wine vinegar is that red wine is the most common wine during this period um, because basically all um, wine grapes end up being red grapes. They just um, crush them differently and, and don't use the skins to, as I understand it, I'm not an expert on wine, and they just um, you don't use the skins when they want to make it into white wine. Um, whereas if you just crush the whole grape, you'll get red wine. So we've got now our thing with, with, with vinegar. And I use quite a bit of, of vinegar in this and I'll add that to our stock. Now I'm going to turn this so that you can see the, the stove here. And so I've got my stock here and you can actually probably see that it's actually already quite a yellow sauce because of the saffron that's in it. And once I get those egg yolks in, it will be even more golden. So I've got my egg yolks here, I'm gonna beat them. Beat them very well, so I'm yes, beating them very well. And I found that if I, what I wanna do is add, just add a little bit of the stock in with the egg yolks, just to kind of stretch it almost and um, make it a bit more liquid to go in. And that helps minimize the chances of the egg splitting uh, and, uh, and the sauce splitting. A little bit more. And you can see the color is very, very bright yellow, partly because of my beautiful 
girls eggs partly because of that saffron so now i'm going to turn that on and i'm just threading as i stir threading and i have just done it in two directions um, and stir that in while i thread the egg yolks in and again it's best to do this when the when the um your liquid from the lamb is is not too hot because you don't want to cook the egg um, as it goes into the into the sauce because otherwise you'll end up with kind of scrambled eggs rather than a thickened sauce there we go there's our sauce and now we just heat this up well again don't bring it to the boil as such because that's going to be a bit of a shock to it but just stirring it and it says in one direction i'm not quite sure why it has to be one direction but i'm going to believe it and i'm going to go clockwise um, until it thickens so there we go now i make this with a reasonably large amount of, of vinegar because um, at the end you are going to add a little honey to it and so with the salt from the lamb stock and the vinegar and the honey you actually have kind of all of the senses of uh, most of the senses that um or tastes that you need you need um to, to get a really balanced um sauce so i used probably a, a to, to this two cups of of stock i probably used maybe a quarter a cup of vinegar and I'll just actually give that a little taste. Yeah, that's reasonably sharp and it will taste quite sharp, but um, but once at the end you add the honey, then it will balance out. magic of cooking now you get to watch me stir a pot, stir a pot. isn't that exciting <laughs> if there were comments i'd be asking them now but there aren't any in the chat currently so <laughs> everyone's being the strong and silent type i think everyone's just waiting with bated breath to, to see the donuts in action really um, so you said earlier too many donuts i'm not sure that's actually a thing <laughs> Uh, well, I live by myself, and each batch of this makes about 12 donuts um, or more, and I have made six versions of it. <laughs> there are, is such a thing as too many donuts. 70 donuts is too many donuts for one person. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> I still have leftover donuts, which I'm giving to the chickens um, sort of slowly uh uh you know not too many at a time because they're not very good for you i i guess i like the fats but i don't like giving too much sugar but yeah i have a bag of donuts here i can actually show you actually i probably could show you a bit about the different textures that that came with the donuts here so this is a donut which is a ball rather than a and a, and a ring and you can see here a kind of rise are the holes that um, have appeared in the donut from the, from the frying. Um, this one is one of the ones which was with the butter dough, and I don't know if you can see the texture is a bit finer, and it's a bit harsh, harder the dough. Uh, this is one of the the ones with the with which was the sourdough rise, um, has a slightly finer um, crumb to it. Um, so there's a few different types of dough. And we have a question on how well do donuts freeze if you want to make them in advance for an event? Um, my experience is that they do not, they they can be reheated. The best, but the best way to reheat a donut is if you make them in advance. All you need to do is pop one in the microwave for about 10 seconds would do for a, for a donut, 15 seconds for two donuts, and that will refresh them as if they were brand fresh spanking new. But most fried foods are not brilliant for, for um, making in advance and cooking and um, allowing to cool and reheat. 
So ideally what I think I would probably do is make the dough in the advance and fry them on the, sp on the spot at the, at the uh, event. What about freezing the dough itself? Well, I think freezing the dough would be fine. Um, I would freeze it in, probably freeze it in shape. Um, uh, you could like, um, yeah, uh, pizza dough, for example, you can freeze the pizza dough and give it and then take it out of the freezer. Uh, I, I, what I do with pizza is I freeze it as a lump of, of dough flattened out into a kind of flattish disc. Um, and once it's frozen, I um, vacuum seal it. And then uh, when I want it, I can, I, you can either pull it out and leave it in the, in the vacuum sealed thing just to, 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 to thaw. Um, and then uh, allow it to do a, its second rise format and then allow it to do its second rise. Um, yeast is an, an amazing creature and it does um, survive being frozen. In fact, I keep my, my fresh yeast in uh, my, um, sorry, my instant yeast in the freezer and use it straight from the freezer. Um, you could form them into the donuts potentially and freeze them in form. Um, and freeze them directly after you've formed them so that they haven't risen, but they're formed and then pull them out, um, keep them, cover them with a damp cloth because otherwise, or, um, or plastic wrap, I guess, um, uh, and then allow them to thaw out and do, do their kind of rise. And just now, my sauce here. 10 minutes. Sorry? You have about 10 minutes. No, not already. All right. All right, we're going to have to get on to some frying, aren't we? Definitely. So you can see my sauce here. I'll, get, I'll, I'll finish up with this sauce, which has in fact thickened a bit, but probably maybe not quite as much as I'd like it to just yet. Maybe it might, it might have needed a, a third egg yolk, but I've run out of eggs. It's winter time, so the girls are a bit slack about their laying. Once you've got it kind of quite stirred in, it does blend. You can, can, can actually bring it up to quite a high temperature. Um, so this is actually boiling. But you can see there, this, the the dough, the um, sauce is a um, a kind of thickened a little bit, but it probably could have used another egg yolk. But it's thickened a little bit, and is done. And then I will get add a bit of honey. Got some lovely Australian honey here, which is probably a little stronger in taste than the honeys would have been in period. Add that little bit of honey to get that kind of little bit of a sweet balance to it. Right. Mm, very, very tasty. The, the cloves in this one are quite heavy, um, but not too, not overpowering. And the, um, oops, it's a little bit, Sweet and sourish almost because it's got the, the vinegar and it's got the honey in it. And I might add a little bit tiny bit more honey, but essentially that's done. All you have to do now is pour it back over to over lamb or add your lamb back into it and heat it together to make your final lamb stew. So that's your your lamb dish. But let's get on the fun stuff, hey? Time for our donuts. I'm gonna tilt the camera up. And what I've got here is I'm using a deep fryer. Um, I come from a family that doesn't fry very much. And um, I, I, so I consider myself frying, almost frying disabled. <laughs> I'm just really not very good at it. And a deep fryer um, solves the problem for me. It's, it's the equivalent of our pot of, stove, a pot of oil on the, um, on the fire. So here's my deep fryer, which is nice. I've got that to temperature previously. Let's get a donut in there. So we've got our donuts here, those in the basket. And I always flip them over just because the bottoms are a bit damp and they will stick to the to the fryer basket a bit, whereas the kind of slightly drier tops will not. Hear that sound? So doing its quiet frying here. Those are the because the, the point of the the, the um <laughs> the part of the point of the, the the fryer is that it's got a filter built into it so that it will. Not. Okay, good. Sugar. You 
might need to turn them over, but often they turn themselves over into the pan. And they really don't take long at all to cook. Show you, there we go. I think I will just turn these over and pop them just a second longer. They are a lovely golden color, just as the recipe says. I'm just putting them on some paper to paper towel to drain. I'll throw a few more. Those can go in. So here we have our hot donut. Now, while it's still hot, I've um, uh, I, I will take a. Uh, the paper towel. If you've got your, your your oil to a really good temperature, you'll find that there isn't a lot of oil left on the um, plate. Let's see if I if you can see. I'm not sure. No, the light's not very good. Um, but it is leaving a little bit of oil on the paper, but not really very much. Um, and that means that the oil's at a good temperature. If your oil's a bit low, they'll become quite oil clogged. And um, what do you guys? Be much kind of greasier. So there we go, pop those on a plate. Now I'm going to tip that back down again so you can kind of see my plate here. Down. See my plate here. There's my 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 finished donuts. And I will have that honey two seconds ago. Did you see where I put the honey? <laughs> Somebody's hidden my honey. About five yes. minutes. If you run over a little bit, <laughs> but about five minutes. Yeah. Well, the timing is pretty good. So I'm going to just drizzle some honey on it, like so. And I like to do that while it's nice and hot so I can absorb it. Oh, so good. And then I have cinnamon sugar already mixed up. So I'm going to use my mixed cinnamon sugar on top. And voila, here is our beautiful cinnamon donuts. And I'll let them cool for a second while we chat again, um, before I taste test them for you. So if anyone is, any politicopolans are watching, I'm gonna bring the leftovers tomorrow to our weekly meet. So you can all try one. So I tried the, the, on the a slight talk on the on the different substances and the different quantities of cheese. I have had a look and seen there are a couple of other people who have experimented with this recipe, and um, neither of the recipes which I found that other people had done had nearly as much cheese in them. My early versions had a very only a very little bit of cheese, and then I upped the cheese and then upped the cheese again, and I found that this mixture with the um, 300 grams in total of, of cheeses to the two cups of flour is just a really nice balance of flavour and a really it's really mild flavour, um, but is a really nice. So here is our lovely sticky donut, now cool enough for me to tear. I wish you could sm smell it and taste it, and you could see this beautiful golden inspired. Crisp. Mm. Mm. So it's a very um tasting history thing to be do to do to be munching into it. But the texture is not as as light as a, a modern donut. So it's not as fluffy, 
Um, it's a little bit more almost doughy, but not not unpleasantly doughy. Um, it's just got a really nice texture and a really good flavour. And of course, with honey and cinnamon and sugar on top, what's not to prove? Mm. So, since we don't have very much longer um, in the way of time to to for for me to take up. Does anyone have any questions they would like to ask? Apart from, you know, when can you come and eat some of my cooking? <laughs> they look yummy. Sadly, I don't have anything that appealing here for breakfast. Ah, well, make the dough, let it um, rise in the fridge overnight. Um, that'll give it a really long, slow rise. And then you can have them for breakfast tomorrow morning. Cook them fresh for yourself. Is the honey and sugar the actual recipe or is that just your preference, Curiel? No, no, that's the actual recipe. It really is, um, is you know, really resembles our modern donuts in that sort of sense. I mean, modern donuts don't have cheese in them, so that's the big, big difference. But, but yeah, no, the recipe literally says, and then sprinkle, uh, it says, and moisten, oh, no, sorry, wrong recipe. And it literally says, cast your honey on it and cast sugar and cinnamon on top. So, yeah, it really is supposed to have honey and cinnamon and sugar. So, any other questions or comments? Updates? <laughs> Everyone's inviting themselves over for, for donuts, but... <laughs> <laughs> so I um I did keep track of the other recipes if you wanted to try um and and I can provide you with the proportions for the um that I tried for the other ones if you would like to give a full experimentation um and try and copy my versions I would love to hear your um your interpretations of it and whether you think that I've chosen the right kind of mixture and whether you've chosen the right proportions when you try and make this for yourself. Um, and you will make yourself very, very popular at um, events, um, being able to tell them that you have found a 16th century or that you have got a 16th century Spanish donut recipe. <laughs> Marina's saying that she wants to come down to Canberra now. My, she, Marina's my apprentice and she uh, lives up in Sydney, which is kind of the next big, biggest town to Canberra. Oh, there's one in between really, but it's about 150 kilometres to, to the next town and then Sydney's about 320 kilometres away. So it's not so far. All right, if there's nothing else, I will end the recording. Ah, there's a oh. comment. You see it? Yeah, saying that she kind of twisted them into a, a sort of, made them into a roll of, of dough and then twisted them into a kind of infinity by the sound of it symbol. I think you could, and, and, and you could try and form them into any shape, because I mean, it says that you can form it into, into any ostentation you like. So perhaps, um, having you know you could attempt to make one and form one into the shape of a crown or something like that that could be quite fun to do um you could attempt to to form one into a, a heraldic beast perhaps yeah, now i'm going to make a crown out of this one somehow did you put the proportions or measured amounts in the handout for this one yes i did for my other recipes that I've made, I haven't because they, um, the marzipan for invalids actually tells you in the original recipe exactly the proportions of it. And for the lamb stew, the proportions are, are, are not really very relevant. But for this one, yes, in the handout, I have actually given my full um, recipe. Um, so I just formed one into a little West Kingdom crown here since they're our hosts <laughs> for the event. I don't know that there's anyone from West Kingdom still awake at this hour. <laughs> <laughs>